Okay, one second, let me just get my screen all situated. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, sweet, thank you. Well, so thank you again for having us. I'm Allison and this is Iris. And on behalf of Elena, Yvonne, and Bree, whose um, artwork is scattered throughout this presentation, we make up the Kindling Equity team at the Bren School of University of Santa Barbara. And today we'll be discussing our work with the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council um, and are helping them put together a plan for more inclusive wildfire management in Ventura County. So as Californians, we all live around wildfire. Many of you have looked out your windows and seen the glow of smoke of wildfire or maybe even suffered poor air quality from a wildfire event. And during the 2021 fire season, two of the most destructive fires in our modern history as a state were in Ventura County. And even before that, the Thomas Fire destroyed 1,063 structures and the Woolsey Fire of 2018 um, destroyed six, um, 1,643 structures. And as our planet continues to warm, we expect to see more extreme and more frequent wildfires, especially in already arid regions like Ventura County. And while physical impacts of wildfire are well understood, the social impacts, which are just as important, must be clearly understood as well. So many communities across California and the West United States face wildfire, but not all are affected equally. So social marginalization, which is systematic exclusion based on social identities, including gender or race, means some households do not have the resources to prepare and recover from wildfires like others do. Marginalization increases residents' vulnerability to wildfire. And we can visualize this link spatially in Vancouver County. Now this is a map that represents um, risk to potential structures in addition to social vulnerability, vulnerability index. And where those meet is this purple region in the middle, which includes Santa Paula and Piru. Um, and these places overall um, are a higher risk and this leads to heightened vulnerabilities for these communities and reduces overall resilience within the county. Um, and this link is not currently addressed in um, Ventura County's wildfire planning documents, but it should be if we wanna protect all communities from wildfire. Now, a tool we believe we can use to help unlink these two things is a CWPP. I'm sure you all know this, but a CWPP or Community Wildfire Protection Plan are plans that outline wildfire preparation projects on a community scale and involve collaboration among local stakeholders to identify and prioritize, prioritize wildfire risk mitigation strategies, including vegetation management and wildfire education. And these guide actions by many community partners, including local fire departments, businesses, and HOAs. And our project's findings will be used by the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council to help update their current plan. And we believe that it's a potential tool to decouple marginalization and vulnerability, but in the past, CWPPs have not done this. And this is mainly because planning processes are, have not been accept, um, accessible to all communities. And therefore, specific materials and programs need to be employed to ensure um, that the process is more inclusive. Now to update this plan in a way that delinks marginalization and vulnerability, we sought to answer um, these three questions with our project. First, who in Ventura County is most vulnerable to wildfire impacts due to environmental risk and social marginalization? Second, what are their specific barriers to preparing for wildfire? And lastly, how can wildfire management planning address these issues? So we took two approaches to investigate these vulnerabilities. We first conducted a countywide survey to understand the broad impacts um, experienced with and perceptions that county residents have with wildfire. And we received just over 400 usable responses. And then we then used our survey results to guide and inform two focus groups to obtain a more nuanced understanding of specific community concerns that community members have. And we specifically, um, conducted focus groups in Santa Paula, which is a focus group conducted entirely in Spanish to get a sense of what non-English speaking residents had to say, in addition to Piru, which focused on lower income residents. 
And while our methods covered a variety of wildfire topics, today we're gonna to be talking about two primary, primary categories to vulnerability, which are community needs to, for evacuation and barriers that folks have in evacuating safely. And now when asked about community actions that were desired in regard to wildfire, a majority of our respondents responded evacuation preparation. Um, and when we looked even further, we saw that of those respondents that chose evacuation preparation, 76% of them identified as women. Um, and this tells us that women are less likely to report being prepared to evacuate during a wildfire event and also gives us a clue into how gender identity can play a role in wildfire risk, including the extra concerns that one may have as they're often the caretakers of the household. And we saw this as a recurring theme in some of our focus group discussions, um, many mothers being vocal about safety for their children and elders in their household. And so we have a quote from a woman in our Santa Paula focus group that demonstrates this pretty well. And the quote is, we have kids with disabilities, so it's hard to be sure you have all of the medication and there isn't time to get everything. It's hard to know what to bring and have the essentials prepared in time because we don't know in advance. People here have six to seven kids, so it's difficult to know how to get everyone out. And so this quote pretty powerfully um, shows all of the barriers regarding communication um, for resources, especially in regards to evacuation. And we also see a lot of these sentiments expressed in our second set of findings. Um, and I'm gonna have Iris um, take over for those. All right, thanks, Allison. Um, so we continue to see this link between social marginalization and wildfire vulnerability when we look at residents' barriers to safely evacuating. So these barriers vary based on demographic factors. Here in this figure, we see the proportion of survey respondents, so their demographics are on the left, who highlighted a particular barrier, and those barriers are on the bottom. So squares that are darkly shaded show more respondents from that demographic group reported facing that barrier. So we continue to see a pattern um, among women related to evacuation. So a higher proportion of residents who identified as women did not know when to leave or were not ready to leave when compared to men. We also see the pattern of not knowing when to leave among older adults. Finally, when we look at non-English speakers in the bottom row, um, they were overall more vulnerable. So nearly every square here is darker than other groups. Um, and they reported both communication barriers as well as resource limitations. So each of these groups face uh, barriers disproportionately compared to other respondents. And these barriers um, further demonstrate the link between marginalization and vulnerability and indicate that a lack of inclusive planning processes, um, which would have otherwise addressed them. So the updated CWPP should include solutions that break this link in, in order to protect these communities. Um, and while lack of information is one barrier, in many cases, communities um, knew exactly what they needed, um, but it's just the resources were unavailable to them. So again, um, we wanna highlight that evacuation is just one example of a vulnerability, um, but this link shows up in other areas of wildfire preparedness and recovery. So uh, we categorize the barriers highlighted by residents in Ventura County into three main categories. So first there are communication barriers, so barriers in how people receive information about wildfire and evacuation. And next we see um, resource limitations. So these are the physical resources that people need to make important decisions about their safety. And finally, we see exclusionary planning processes. So these limit how people can engage um, in the wildfire planning process and share their local expertise. So these categories expose the broad gaps that still exist and um, show us where solutions can be implemented. 
So we recognize that our recommendations will not eliminate social marginalization or injustice, um, but they are key first steps in building a, a more equitable wildfire planning process. So let's walk through some potential solutions. So in order to address uh, communication barriers, which are again related to how people um, are educated about wildfire and how they get information about evacuation and wildfire events. So some potential solutions are using traditional risk mitigation programs, but in a more inclusive way. For example, um, emergency notifications could be improved to offer uh, messages in multiple languages. Um, materials and training could also be translated into other languages and um, be created in a highly visual way so that people who aren't fluent in that language can still understand. Um, we can also use community health workers or promotoras to um, help prepare residents and they would act as peer educators in the community and building trust, but also disseminating wildfire um, information. So um, our next barrier is resource limitations. So we see this when people report not having transportation or they can't afford alternate shelter during an evacuation. So some solutions are to expand resources to support those who are most affected but are excluded from traditional uh, types of financial aid. So that could be done through an emergency uh, relief fund. It could be incentives to support renters who are preparing uh, their homes for wildfire. Or it could be programs that support uh, stronger social networks so that um, folks are able to get uh, the resources they need through these networks. Um, and for example, this could be programming to connect older adults um, who, so they can build the social infrastructure um, to support um, isolated folks. So all of these are practical communities that um, are practical problems that communities have identified. So they aren't just knowledge gaps. And we wouldn't have learned about these barriers if we hadn't conducted focus groups. So this highlights why community members need to be involved in the planning process so they can point out these gaps, um, which can then be addressed through policy. So focus groups are a really powerful way to collect community expertise. Um, we can also use community advisory councils to give residents more decision-making power in the wildfire planning process, or we can engage with local community leaders who are already embedded um, within the fabric of the community. So strategies should seek to rebuild trust with um, historically excluded communities and to facilitate uh, greater engagement and the dialogue between agencies and um, residents. So living in California, we've all experienced wildfires in some way. So seeing a large smoke cloud, waking up to an emergency uh, notification, um, these can be very unsettling or frightening experiences. Um, yet social circumstances make wildfires more devastating for certain residents. So imagine how much more difficult it would be if you didn't have the resources to transport your family to safety during an evacuation, or you had to choose between working to support your family or evacuating, or imagine receiving an emergency notification in a language that you aren't fluent in. So for these reasons, it's important that we break the link between marginalization and vulnerability, and this requires solving problems uh, within communities um, with thoughtful solutions that are rooted in local knowledge. So the Community Wildfire Protection Plan can be the tool that does this because it works um, at the local level. So while our findings and research were tailored to address um, Ventura County, our methods and processes can help guide um, and inform other communities such as Santa Barbara on how to be more inclusive um, and address inequity in their planning process. 
So CWPPs should be tailored and adapted in a way that best serves their communities. So we'd like to thank our community partner, um, our advisors, our additional mentors, and our funders for supporting this project. So thank you so much. Um, we can take any questions that you might have. Thank you to both of you. Uh, quite a presentation. We're like we're digging deep into the same kind of issue right now with trying to get our fireways communities in. Uh, Scott or Scott, can you guys? Since we're right in the middle of that CWPP, is what do you guys think about that? Either Scott or both. Yeah, I um, I, I think this is insanely compelling. Um, you guys hear me okay? A little unstable internet. We're okay. R really compelling, and and um, I'm I'm thinking about like in our the Gavietta CWPP we're writing at right now. I'm looking at some of those community folks and. Um, you know, the renters and, and possibly elderly people in that and thinking about there are different communities and trying to reach them. And my guess is I, I'm sure the data that you're supporting in Ventura is going to be similar for Santa Barbara. So I would um, definitely make sure that uh, the other Scott on the call right now, um, you know, we get this, you know, put into our plan and kind of make sure that we identify those marginalized folks in our communities and, um, you know, reach out to them and make sure it's in the plan, number one. Um, but I, I really think that uh, this transcends over to Santa Barbara. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that um, number one, we'll put it in the plan for sure. But the other, the other thought of it is, is we're maybe working with you guys uh, doing very similar things to Santa Barbara. It's just, I mean, to me, it just seemed incredibly compelling. I don't know if you had any comments, uh, Scott Eckert. <clears throat> yeah, nothing further, Scott. I think just incorporating this into the, you know, into the recommendation section would be, would be great. Yeah. Hey. Then I just, this is Rob. Um, I just had a question. Um, the CWPPs that you guys looked at in Ventura, how, how were they structured in regards to um, their development teams? I, I know like in Santa Barbara County, we have multiple CWPPs. Some of them have been really very agency specific where essentially a fire district just created a CWPP with the uh, help of a consultant and they would do a few meetings to elicit some public input. We've had other CDP, CWPPs that, that were very uh, community driven with a large committee that we call it the development team um, year, uh, like a year of, of monthly meetings, bringing all, all of the development team in and the development team members were based on the community. So we reached out when we put these development teams together. And this is similar to what we did with this, this one that's in development right now, the Gaviota Coast CWPP, we reached out to the communities and said we would like representatives from all of the identified communities to sit in on the development team. Did Was that happening in Ventura or? You know? Yeah, I can I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I worked with the Fire Safe Council over the summer into the fall. And I know that the 2010 one did not do any of that. Um, I know that the current ones, there's the large county-wide one, and then there's also, I believe, 10 more local ones, and they partner with specific community councils, like the Peru Community Council. I know there's a West Side Council. I'm not sure exactly the structure of their development teams, but I do know the local ones are like um, Kate, who's the program manager at the Ventura, has really tried to pair with people like local organizations that can really help um, get all the public input and then Kate can help with more like the administrative stuff. Okay. But do you know if they were like specifically on their development team, like getting community leaders from those identified communities? Like that seems for us up here, that's been really helpful because those people are like ambassadors to their actual community, like the neighborhood itself. We're literally going in and going, okay, this is the San Marcos Trout Club. We need somebody from this neighborhood. And we try to find the person who's like the, the leader of, you know, essentially if it's an HOA, it's, it's pretty easy. Cause you can, you have already a, an organization, but a lot of our communities in Santa Barbara have sort of unofficial uh, leaders that are, everybody kind of knows, Oh, that's the person who knows about fire and who has interactions with the fire department. And, you know, we trust them. And, and so that's, that's been sort of helpful in regards to capturing all of those nuances with that community, the, the specific issues that they have. Yeah, I know that in um, Piru specifically, Michael Lopez, who might be a familiar name, he is 
the one spearheading that and I'm not sure about the other ones but I do think the intention was to go with some like local leaders not necessarily if they're affiliated but yeah I'll just throw out the question I, I mean CWPPs are a planning tool but the end of the day, whether people are able to successfully evacuate um, people who don't have transportation is going to kind of depend on whether their neighbors are going to help them or whether there's some public resource to do that. And I, I don't think the government will be able to do it. So at some point, it has to lead to organization of, of the neighborhoods. I mean, more like what Firewise is, is intended to do. Um, so I hope that's part of the long range plan. Um, I'll just give an example up here. We, we have one you know, elderly woman with a disabled son and we have kind of informal arrangement. You know, people are gonna go over and help them get into easy lift or drive them out of the community when we have a fire. But if we had 10 families with seven children and each with one car, we would have a very, very difficult problem. But maybe in a, some neighborhoods, there'd be enough people with two cars to help. Uh. Yeah, I definitely think that that is like part of the long range planning process. Um, I think right now, just trying to get agency coordination. But then I do, yeah, I do agree that that's not going to be able to save or like solve all the problems. So that's a really good insight. On the, the Firewise. <laughs> Uh, is a good complement to the CWPPs because because Phil's right. The CWPPs are more just, hey, this is what we could do, we should do. This is what the community wants to see. Um, but Firewise is like ongoing. We're going to do these things. And um, a lot of the mitigation stuff that Firewise could do will start to, you know, spe looking specific at the evacuation part, um, Firewise, if truly realized, all of the mitigation measures, you know, and all the broader mitigation measures that we're talking about for wildland fire starts to really chip away at the even need to evacuate. Like that's at the end of the day, if we don't have to panic evacuate, and it's kind of a big deal for me because I am engaged in evacuation efforts all the time and they're always chaos, no matter what you do. Our roads aren't good enough. I mean, it doesn't matter what neighborhood you're in. In fact, in Santa Barbara County, some of the affluent neighborhoods have the worst evacuation setups because they're um, they're in topography with narrow roads and all these people trying to get out and it's a nightmare. So versus the kind of our, our urban areas uh, with lower income neighborhoods actually have way better evacuation uh, infrastructure because they have a network of streets that are all like a grid and they can get onto the freeways fast. Um, but for me, it's really about like, <laughs> if we could just get to the point where wildland fire doesn't require the panic evacuations and it can be more measured. Yeah, that's the only way we're ever really gonna sort of solve the, the panic mode that everybody seems to be in is, is to mitigate the risk on the front end. And then you don't have to do so much of the hurry up and go thing. I know it's not always achievable with weather, fuels, topography, and wildland fire, but I think there's a lot of improvements we can do. And that's, again, that's where the CWPP combined with the Firewise, really, if we really do it right, if we really actually do it, we could get a long ways to that. You know, I'd, I'd like to jump in here, uh, Rob. Um, I'm thinking like, um, you know, because I just wrote that um, uh, Firewise plan for the Hollister Ranch, and um, I can tell you right now, like the uh, when you look at the risk analysis and you look at your three-year action plan for Firewise, that stuff that um, Iris uh, and Allison just talked about is not in that action plan. And I think necessarily um, in those marginalized communities, I mean, that's going to be at the forefront of our of our three-year action plan that's in Firewise. So to me, I, I think it's a glaring missing element. And um, I got I think in Santa Barbara, it behooves us to make sure, um, you know, that we, you know, we identify that because um, I, I just think in the, the plan I just wrote, you know, it was just flat missing. So so we've got some work to do. Good point, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, just to uh, jump in about that. Um, so when we made that map that showed the intersection, um, these were marginalized communities that were at risk of wildfire. So that's why like um, places like maybe Oxnard weren't really highlighted on the map. So that's something that could be done easily in Santa Barbara as well, if you're 
if you're looking specifically at the intersection of where wildfire risk is really high and where um, folks might not have as many resources. And I, and I think that the county, um, they already did a, a very similar uh, analysis. It was for the climate uh, change vulnerability assessment they just did, the county planning department. Um, and it looked at the intersection of uh, vulnerability and, and then also whatever risk that they were looking at. So, I mean, it wasn't just wildfire. They were looking at to, you know, increasing temperatures, you know, risk for those types of situations, sea level rise, all that kind of stuff. But they did, they had it for wildland fire and they, it looked, the map looked kind of similar to what you guys had there. They're obviously different colors and stuff, but it was a similar kind of thing where it looked at, Hey, these are the disadvantaged communities. And then this is wildfire risk. And then it looked at how they came together all under the lens, obviously of climate change adaption or vulnerability. You know, one, one other one that I uh, remember when I was farm marshal down in Carpinteria, the um, be the care facilities, the six packs, the 12 packs, those uh, those care, those small care facilities that are tucked up into the brush. Um, that was always, you know, uh, a scare. And um, what kind of blew me out was there's a lot of them. I mean, the countywide Santa Barbara, there is just a whole m bunch of them. So that they would be a gopher for making sure we have good plans to get those folks out. <clears throat> Hey, any other questions for Iris or Allison? I was just going to ask, you know, from your perspectives and the work you're doing, and I see uh, Sarah Anderson joined us as well, you know, from an organizational perspective, um, trying to attract uh, some of these more vulnerable residents and communities to an organization like ours that we could potentially learn how we could um, possibly help them. Do you have any thoughts on how we can do a better job of, of um, doing that? Um, I can start and if RF wants to jump in, I definitely, one of the really successful strategies was tapping into the Promotores, which was a community health organization and they really helped spread our message and they helped recruit for our focus groups. Um, and I, I'd say so tap finding like local organizations that um, engage those communities was really helpful for us. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Um, just the infrastructure is already there for existing organizations. So all you have to do is like make an alliance with them. Cool, thanks. Yeah, we, we recently hired um, somebody, Gustavo, I think they had to drop off, but he worked for Listos and has some relationships. I think he's going to do a lot of benefit in connecting. Um, he has a lot of relationships with that, with those communities already. So thank you. Yeah, that's a great idea. Any other questions? You could get that, uh, your and share with your presentation with Nick that we put on our website. That'd be all right. That'd be awesome for us too. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming and the work you've done on this. Very important. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having us.